Hello everyone, welcome to the AOI Streams, in-depth conversations with digital artists and experts to explore how blockchain technology is impacting the future of art. AOI, also known as Art on Internet, is the movement for emerging art and technology. I'm Federica and today I'll be your host. In this episode, we invite generative artists William Mapan and Shei Wu to walk us through the creative process behind their one-on-one artworks for the first Inner Code group exhibition that we have today I think we can start with that. William Mapan is a, she, he's an artist coder he's a teacher based in France and he said that he dedicates his work to bridge words through color texture and composition to create the unexpected. That's a, such a beautiful way to to put your work William. And then we have Shei Wu he's a new media artist he dedicates to integrate art with computer science and he's also a teacher of creative coding and new media art. Very, very excited for, for this amazing um, combination today. Um, I think what we can start with, it's a little bit of a discussion around some topics on generative art that I think I would really love for you guys to, to comment on. One time I, I heard William saying that um, you see the computer as a tool, an extension of your body. But with generative art, you see the computer as actually a collaborator and a partner. So I wanted to ask you, why do you find that there's a different connection with the computer, with the machine, according to the type of art that you're making? It's so smart that, you know, it can, it can teach you how to see with a different angle some stuff. So, and most of the time I'm like, yeah, I'm going to do that. And I'm pretty sure of my idea, you know, and. It's completely wrong. And the computer says, no, it's like this. And I'm like, okay, so maybe we should go there. And yeah, it's mostly building upon iteration. So yeah, the, I think the iteration is the conversation in a way. Yeah, that's, yeah, that's, yeah. I think it's a good definition here. Yeah. Iteration is the conversation. <laughs> yeah, I also think like computer is kind of, it's like a partner that can help you like break through some boundaries or let you thought of, you haven't thought of ever before so like often i when i'm creating works i just like set the kind of like several rules and then like computer just give me like a lot of different accidents or inspirations that uh that is out of my expectation so i think uh it's more like um a partner and um, like a design like inspiration to me so is the machine an artist as well? And like, how much credit does the machine should have? Like, is the machine like a, a human part in this? What, what do you guys think about the, the idea of, you know, kind of like humanizing the machine and giving it credit for an artistic art? Uh, I can start with it. <laughs> yeah. So I think um, and this question is a little bit similar to like, if you ask someone if a camera is an artist, a hundred years ago mm-hmm. so if we ask this question actually we are thinking about what um what do we think what is art and in my uh, perspective i think art is like um a human's story and human's uh, life experience and that human like that people have some love things some hate things or some different emotions to the subjective world and what that's that the all all the elements and stories get together is the art itself so i think um, actually, I think machine can be artist, but um, in another sense is that um, a human and a machine pair as a partner can maybe can be a better artist than human itself or a machine itself. Like, I mean, with art, one like an important component of art is intention, the, you know, the intent, the creative intent. And well, I'm not talking about AI because it's a completely different subject, but with generative, generative art, you're still in control of the algorithm of your of your code, and it's it's up to us to to inject some chaos. So in that way, it's a partnership because you you can't control the chaos and you can't imagine anything, everything possible, like all the possibilities. You can't imagine them all, but I I still don't see machine as the artist because. It's not the machine that is that wants, you know that 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 has the creative inputs, basically. And um, and since we're we're talking about your relationship and the creative connection with the machine, um, I wanted you guys to tell us a little bit about um how you discovered generative art, how you got into it, 
because William, I know your career comes from um, advertising industry and now you're teaching creative coding and same for you, Shiryu, you, you were um, studying electrical engineering. So I kind of wanted to, to touch a little bit about uh, your um, careers before you arrived to, to generative art. Maybe we can start with William. Uh, sure. Uh, so yeah, I've been working like, for 12 years in the advertising industry, first as a motion designer, and then quickly I, 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 was, I was like, I need to you know, optimize my workflows with motion design. So I started to code uh, in my motion design tools. And yeah, I became a creative developer like that. My background, like my education is I have a weird degree where I studied a bunch of things, more, more or less useful today, but a bunch of things like you know communication, uh, design, uh, computer science, uh, and art history at that time. But it was very boring, like 5,000 of students in one room and, and one teacher uh, just talking about the yeah, boring stuff, really. <laughs> and I was like, yeah, it's not for me art so I started to go more to museum you know and exhibition uh, vernissage you know all this uh, stuff and uh, yeah at some point I think six years ago uh, I stumbled onto like works from you know the pioneer like uh, more a month when more uh, draws knees um, trader make uh, you know all these people there I'm all now all these people there are some books some video and I was like what the what the hell is that? You know, because I was I was coding on the side and I was trying to make beautiful stuff with my code. And I was experimenting a lot with different type of medias, with paint, with anything really, but with no goal. And at some point, when I saw that, I was like, "What is what is that?" And that's how I learned about Chanty Art. Okay, that is that is a thing actually. So let's uh, let's get into it, and then I started my journey like that, basically. I also stepped into generative art fields super late because uh, my original degree is electrical engineering. Since I'm very young, I play with some like flash animation or creating some like design a little bit just like uh, games, but that is just my hobby. But my main route is to study hard and to, and to enter like an engineering company <laughs> when, I, when I'm like in college. But um, since in college, I found out that I have some desire to create something more visual or more belongs to me because most of the time when we are solving electrical engineering problems, we make like microchips, we make, uh, or we solve some like um, electrical like devices issue. But I think that uh, we don't, we, we are not able to identify who made this through that kind of production. So that's why I started my own design company, start to make some like posters, <laughs> start my name card or visual designs. Then also I step a little bit also into motion design. I mean, I play with effort after effects and I play with some logos flying around <laughs> and that is a good time. And that's, um, that's like a hobby to me and very, very relaxing. And then after that, I one day I saw my designer, my uh, one of my friend also doing like and it made it website or interactive websites. That, and the, after that, I started to learn about this. All the things overlap together. Like I, I noticed that visual design and animations and program uh, programming, like codings, they can really like combine to each other really well. Because, because yeah, when, you, when we work with engineering you know, problems, it's all about solving stuff. Yeah. And yeah, and yeah I think, you know, as, as human, we always need like a door to escape and. And when you have this engineering background, I think it's really interesting, you know, to speak for yourself with your skill set. So yeah, it's it's basically the same for me. So it's really really yeah, like bit two, two, or, yeah. Yeah. two or three years ago, I, I'm not a I, I don't prefer to call myself an artist, but now I can say I'm an artist because I love what I I love what I create. I love what my in like intention of creating something yeah. different that resemble myself. Yeah. Yeah, I think it's the same for me. I started to call myself an artist like this year actually, because I think this is the first year where I put all my energy and all my thoughts into the practice. And before, you know, it was just a hobby, something on the side, you know, I was yeah. going back from work and after like between you know 8 p.m. and 2 a.m. I was like, yeah, coding as <laughs> a crazy. But uh, I wouldn't still consider myself as an artist back then because, you know, I had 
we are I didn't know why because but because I had a like a day job as a develop, developer was well, like no I'm not an artist I'm a developer first and then I have some weird hobbies but uh, yeah, yeah first time this year I'm like yeah I'm an artist now <laughs> but, uh, it's uh, yeah let's do it <laughs> I, also, I also come through some type of uh, similar lifestyles when I'm in New York I I am engineering a new media company making digital advertisements but in, like at night I'm like I spend all my night and even even like making generative arts and just like a hobby to oh this is fun <laughs> yeah yeah definitely like gentle art creative coding I think it's a rabbit hole you know time hole yeah. where you can because the machine can show you so many stuff that you can't even imagine your there's always something to explore and I think that's that's I think that's what you know keeps us at night basically yeah it's like oh yeah and what's next and what's next and what's behind this door and this one and yeah, yeah so it's an explore uh, explore journey yeah it's interesting though it's almost like do you guys think that like people who um start generative art most of them like started as a hobby because you guys were saying like this would be like something I do after um and that I didn't put too much thought into it as a type of art until like recently so do you think it's because generative art is still still struggles to be defined as art by the world I think it's pretty unknown basically so you know even at the education level I mean, in France, at least, uh, it's very rare that we have some creative coding or generative art lessons uh, in your degree. You just don't know what it is. And you just discover, you know, you're on a Reddit uh, channel or whatever, and you're like, okay, we can make graphical stuff with code as well. And just start noodling and yet yeah, making spaghetti horrible code. And but you're happy because you created a circle on your screen and you're like, whoa, that's amazing. I did that with code. But it's never been something, at least in France, never, it's, it's not, not yet something that people encourage to do. It's more like people come up with it and they're like, yeah, I want to do that. But nobody tells you that there is this opportunity. So, so yeah, I think the visibility of the practice is pretty uh, much low for now. And that's, uh, that's the reason, I, I think. Yeah, I think the route is pretty much unknown when people start this field. Like you, you're you're not able to identify what you're able to do after you make some circles, after you make the circle feels like art, even if you make it artist like a museum label work. Um, like actually I'm still figuring out the problem. Uh, the question is that um is is people really able to identify which art is generative art and which which one is traditional art because like if you just make it into a jpeg it just feels like an image <laughs> to people that are all the same they're just image created by some artists but what is the art heart and what is the core like value of the generative art i think it's like depends on different medium and like uh, but back to the original question i think because this is not uh, generative art is not a work till like last year <laughs> Like, but after NFT, it somehow enables the possibility of artists to live on this, but it's a very early stage art form and early stage tool and not able, <laughs> we are not able to predict how it will going to be. Like last year, maybe two years, uh, is an NFT thing just put some light, you know, on the NFT art because suddenly you have a medium perfectly adapted for the NFT art. And before, like you said, uh, it was mostly images and people don't really understand. So you need context and you need much more effort, you know, to understand the practice. Uh, you know, back then, like the pioneers, like in the 60s, they were considered like crazy people. Like, what the fuck yes. are you doing, you know? And like, what? <laughs> and, and, for now, and now, today, it makes more sense, but back then, it, didn't but today it does but still there's this lack of context and how people understand that this is not just an image it's generated and this is a question i was asking myself yesterday like if you wanna show only one output how do you does it impact the way you make the composition because do you want it to do you want people to understand this is generated with a 
computer or anything else, or I made an image and people were like, yeah, I can do that, you know, with my pencils and whatever tools they, they have. And I was like, this is not the question, but it's <laughs> yeah. not about, you can, okay, and do it. It's, not, it's more about how and the context and, and the why. And I was like, yeah, maybe I didn't show it with a good context, basically, because maybe the image was too simple, but at the same time, it's interesting. It, it means it blends with the traditional art, you know, like, yeah, this is so simple that it could be made with by a human, by a human. But then if you see like a world system, the context change and you're like, oh my God, it's amazing. So I wanted to ask you both, uh, why do you think it's important that we have in real life exhibitions of generative art, like in this case, we have inner code. Why do you think it's important to have a physical presence for generative art, for something that is so digital? I really like uh, physical ex exhibitions because I, I don't love, I, I don't like the feeling that you just open a web page and see that art or see that as an image or video or a little bit <laughs> a square of interacting things. <laughs> I think it's more fun when you like, like and get, like make it into a party make it into like an immersive um ex exhibition make it into a physical ex exhibition just like traditional art we are kind of simulating traditional art but it's not traditional art and i really like the like the concept of the input and output in the in our code exhibition too and i really like the uh the, how we display it differently even through like projections or through like um installation arts i think uh, different mediums can like expand the ability of the generative art because the core of the generative art is we define the rules and we define how it works together to create unpredictable results. So if you make it a static form, it's the less maybe that less interesting way to display it. I think the perfect display device is not invented yet for you know digital art. We still, we still have some way to go, but I think it's still important to have physical display exhibitions because first, uh, like the galleries can educate and and can you know make something contextual to people. They can understand the a practice. Uh, secondly, I think art deserves to be live, basically. So then there's nothing that, com that comes close to experiencing something in real life for now, <laughs> maybe not in the future, but today there is nothing yeah, more immersive than being in person somewhere. So yeah, I think it's very, very important to have physical, should we or should we not have exhibition physical is pretty clear for me that we should, yeah. Physical we really are <laughs> supportive of having a real life exhibitions of alternative art. It's, it's, I think it's very important because it really gives a presence in a space where it usually is not that present, right? So it's like giving, uh, giving attention to a form of art that has been neglected for, for a lot of years, I would say. And uh, can you show us, do you guys have some of the artists that you were looking at uh, when you started, someone that has inspired you uh, when you started your um, your journey in the generative art? In the generative art uh, discipline, it was really, really like journey, journey, journeys for me, one friend more, always. Ted Nate, Rhea Molnar, huge inspiration. But then I like, to take inspiration in other disciplines as well. So I really like painters and people doing crazy stuff with any medium, really, um, because I think with generative art, it's an opportunity to mix culture and techniques and, and concepts. So, so yeah, I don't really have many inspiration in generative art, you know, discipline, but a lot of like outside, like weaving, uh, painting uh, are huge inspiration for me. Because I don't know which painter said that, but like the brush is 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 a translation, direct translation of emotion from the artist. So I like this idea to yeah to paint basically. Yeah.
So then it can be, can be digital or in real, but I think painting is a huge foundation for me. Yeah, uh, on my side, I have three artists that inspire me a lot in my earlier stage of creating like generative arts. I can share a little bit on my screen. If... Yes, please, please go ahead. Yeah, so is, is it available right now? Yes, is screen? Yeah, yeah, so there, uh, the first artist is Tyler Hobbs because like uh, I found her, I, I, found, I found his like essays like three years ago. And that and in that day, I just finished my creative coding uh, class. I I'm a TA in NYU, and then I found out the essay is Taylor Hobbs writes, and I think it's it's super great to see the breakdown of like an artist how to create from algorithm to how to experiment like to a thousand of uh, possibilities and finalize to like uh, several different outputs. So this inspired me a lot with the creative process of that. And then I found out two interesting artists in different countries too. One is Takao. Like Takao is a Japanese artist, um, open processing. That is a platform I use since I started coding, I started coding generative arts and doing daily creative coding challenge. And I found out that there are some like very crazy guys, <laughs> like, but like make a work every day and like oh, he has like that's crazy that's crazy yeah he has like <laughs> one, uh, in nearly 2000 sketches and still till now he's still he's a teacher in japan uh, teaching creative coding so that's why i started daily creative coding i think that's a cool way and very fast way to uh evolve our my my own work and get more ideas of how i can do something and what i want to do and the final one final artist i want to introduce is this one Ma manolo I don't know if William knows him. Yeah, like definitely. His yeah, his work of generative arts also like I think he started very early before, and I noticed that he uh, I love how he uses techniques and how it puts it how to transform it into a more art feeling um, works rather than just like a sketch of digital processing P five JS thing. And I really like the final output and like how he rendered it and displayed on Behance. I think that's very beautiful. <laughs> yeah. And some of that, I, I would just like, if I had, don't have any ideas before, like in a years ago, I would just like dig into his Behance and to see, oh, what, how, how, oh, in how, how he create this and try to figure out maybe there's some techniques or some ideas I can play with. Yeah, that's the three artists. I think that's pretty fun and inspire me a lot. Yeah, I, I would say for my, on my, for my, for me, it's really funny because, uh, like I discovered uh, Tyler Hobbs and and Malo quite late, you know, in my practice, and I was like, oh my god, that there's people doing this already for real, like, you know, in our time, real people doing the, this for like every day, and I was like, amazed by by the idea, and yeah, they, they definitely contribute to my journey. To, you know, to to want to be a generative artist, yeah. Uh, Letitia, I think there's some questions from the audience. So Imperfect Line asks if, how much of a desire do you guys have as generative artists to create something that feels like it was done by a human, um, you know, painted, drawn, etc. And is there any desire, do you have any desire to experiment outside of the uh, traditional mediums for generative art, um, such as painting, drawing, plotters, and so on? Um, so I hope, I hope it all makes sense to you guys. Otherwise, I'm going to ask for some specifications in case, uh, in case I hope, I hope I made it justice, uh, the question. So thank you, Imperfect Line, and to you guys. So I really enjoy traditional mediums. I, I, I paint since like 10, I paint since 10 years ago or something since my high school life. And it's kind of my hobby and I, I still love painting. I feel that the intuitive feeling and how pencils, paintings, watercolor behave in the real world is a kind of is inspiration for what I create in like generative art field. So I create some of the painting. I start, uh, I think this one, <laughs> this one is like when I'm studying in New York, I, I, I create generative arts and use computer all the time. I feel that it's boring when I stare at computer all the day and I, I start to get to some art class to do some painting stuff. And also I have, have a lot of different things. Um, I create things in VR and AR. I create things 
I do a little bit physical computing things to like modifying a, a lamp to like a con computer control or control by dice lamp. And also I do some performance art or um, yeah, and different type of art. I, I really like diff creating in different mediums. I think it's really a back and forth uh, thing that, that goes that with my traditional uh, practice that will I practice a lot the like the colors of the mix how the uh, paintbrush applies on uh, different uh, type of textures i just love the feeling of traditional and it's really something i always ask myself uh, because my work you know is really textured uh, i think it's really because i want to connect myself with my traditional self if i could say like that uh to have like a connection between my computer work and my traditional work like yeah this is me at on the middle and this connects to me uh the, the full the full circles connects to me and it, it doesn't generative art doesn't need to be like human like you know it doesn't need to be textured or anything but i still think it's a good way to connect with your human. That gets me to a question also. Like, um, I saw a lot of different artists start to create human-like or watercolor or texture-like works recently. And I started to think about that if we really need to simulate that well to the, like compared to the real world, or is there any unique works that can only be done by digital arts or generative arts? Mm. Yeah, that's a really good question. I ask this every, every day, <laughs> basically. You know, having like a texture that reminds you anything in your life, like really connects with you. It's a first strong connection. And then I really, I always like to add some digitality, uh, if I can say that, in into into it to say, it is, it looks like hand-drawn, but it's not because there's still some spots where you will wonder if it's made by hand or by computer. So I like to, I like the, the, you know, the, the, the viewer to wonder if this is, how this is made basically. Uh, but yeah, this is, I would say there is a trend, like a trend thing to simulate any type of uh, paint or whatever it is. And sometimes we need, with, because you're always on your computer on on, a, on your phone screen and with a you know, tactical tactile tactile uh, screen you, you always like like some you know feelings and i think art that simulates in, in a way uh, something human is really strong for the brain you know for your emotions so i think it's all about emotions basically yeah I see I see in both of your works references to to nature. And so I wanted to ask you, I feel like this will be, you know, your human connection with um with the for your art. So I wanted to ask you, how do you um, how is your relationship with nature and how do you bring it to your work? Do you have any perhaps any inspiration? Do you usually, let's say, take pictures of something? Um, in your case, William, maybe take pictures of a sky or, or something that's a uh, natural reference yeah. to do you have something to share with us my practice of uh, art is a lot about observation i like just like to to sit somewhere and just watch your the environment you know the sky or the people passing by or it just i don't know there's something outside you know in the real world like like whoa it's it's amazing like this is nature it is, this is amazing and and with generative art and with algorithm there is a really interesting connection that that has been made like a lot of algorithm try to replicate you know with fractals or uh like a lot of algorithm try to replicate what is what we see in nature i think it's just natural to translate what we see in nature to anything we do, basically, because I think this is what we do. We this is what we are. We are nature, and yeah, I'm a very random guy, you know, on the street. Like I stop by and I, I take a photo of you, and you're like, what, what the fuck? 
but uh yeah i really you know take some pictures of skies uh stuff uh videos i don't know it's it just like oh my god it's so beautiful i, I need to capture it so then my brain is like okay this is inside and i will process it at some time and at some time it will converge into my work so yeah, it's it's really about uh serendipity something like that serendipity so does it happen that like you create a piece of work and then you look at it and you're like oh this reminds me of that picture that i took like months ago of that sky or something like that uh mostly with colors i just made something that reminds me this picture i took some a while ago and i go back to the picture and i'm like actually today in the colors of this picture because some weird connection made uh was made in my in my brain that led me to that picture so I like to know why, you know, why did this picture caught my eye? And I like to study, to study this, yeah. I also source a lot from nature and also source a lot from like uh, biology, like math or physics, because I think uh, I really like this because I, I can show some of the, of the things I referenced before. Uh, so uh, I found a lot of different deep sea creatures that feels really digital and feels like um, something that's like more <laughs> like generative art feeling. <laughs> and I didn't notice that it, it's even in the real life, this kind of fish exists. And also I like to source from biology. So like DNA structures, I noticed that like the molecules, like how they twist toward each other or how this um, geometry shapes formed. And I really love to apply this kind of like shape and structures into my own works. So that's why I love particles. I love to make simulation of the system and see how the result of that. And also I really love the particle trace. So this is the particle trace when like scientists try to collide uh, small particles and get what is inside. And they need to see like, the, the curl of the particles and the trace to identify the mass and also how, how it behaves in the space. So I think the, uh, in generative art, we apply a lot of randomness and noise to kind of simulate the nature to get a sense of organic feeling. And I also see like in the real world, there's a lot of things with, um, with shapes that is not very organic. Maybe that's like a sine wave or that's like a, a shape that you can predict or that's very mathematical. And I think the blend of that two words is pretty interesting. Yeah, I think it's fascinating how with math and science we can simulate or describe pretty much everything. It's, I'm really I'm really bad at math, but <laughs> I can see a lot of math good stuff, you know, out there. I'm like, whoa, that's amazing. Yeah, I, I wish I could do that. <laughs> and Shayu, since you were showing us um a little bit of your inspirations, would you mind showing? Uh, a little bit about the creative process behind your artwork for in our code yeah sure sure okay uh so oh the the in our code oh so most of the time i make my works on open processing and as i don't know why i stick to that but i almost open open source all of my works so you can see them um on open processing so the works of the, um, the fairy village work is some um, simulation particle series. So uh, the basic of it is just to create a particle system and then try to give the particles different start um, colors and different, uh, let me move it here. <laughs> I don't know where, oh, okay, that's better. So the basic of this work is try to make some physical simulation thing and give them different um, force and speed when they're moving around the space and define how how fast they move and also how the friction works on the particle itself. So if we, I really like to play with the, for the force. If we cancel the force of that like noisy and sign feeling, the work will become like a totally different thing. It's more like re uh, predictable and more like a gray style thing. And then if we multiply the, like the speed by five, you can see that the particles are moving pretty fast. And most of the time, I'm kind of exploring how I can play with the particles. And maybe we can like put some force to make the particles move toward the center. That's also like a different work. So I, oh, I think th this one is pretty, 
pretty good too. <laughs> yeah, that's really that's yeah. very cool. So we should, yeah. we should save it here. Uh, yeah, I can save it. <laughs> yeah. Oh my god! I'm oh, this one's this one's. I love it even better. <laughs> Never, mind. <laughs> <laughs> Never mind. Changing yeah. your submission now. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, but. I have a little, uh, several works to share about particles, and I just organize them together. So, so just like I mentioned in the physics field, I do a lot of particle works before, like I do electrics on R blocks, and that is to simulate, uh, like the particles in the digital chamber, digital cloud chamber. So it's a little bit similar to the, this work that I just put randomly put some different particles and apply sine and cosine forces to it. But the the really early work I love is this one. Which one is this? This one? Um, oh, that, let me find it there. <laughs> yeah, so in the very early works, I just put some particles on the left side and make them toward the right side. And then... Uh, I just add two formula to make them a little bit affected by the force field in the space. So in this code, if we just remove the sine and cosine force, it, it just looks like particles from left to right. And then I try to add a force that pushes the particles based on the X and Y positions and add a little bit, uh, modify it by sine. So um, they will just draw start drawing circles and start drawing different curves in the space and then in different two in two different directions you can see that it's forming like a very organic and artistic shape and then i can even modify a little bit more like to make them um a little bit some of them will be attracted to the center and some of them will escape so i really like to define this kind of box or experimental simulations to see how the output will be so just make a little bit mention to the recent artworks I'm making is this one, the golden evolution. So you can see that it's kind of the same technique, <laughs> but I'm trying also to make the particles around, apply a little bit of shades, uh, the shadows, and then try to add some leaves to make it just uh, feels like plant. Yeah, and I really, I think I'm still on the route of how exploring how I how far I can push on the particle simulation field to make it more fun. I find it super interesting because we we've been talking about the machine and the human connection, and the more I look at your work and we talk to William as well, uh, the more it's like we're talking about something that's so organic. Um, and I love how it almost looks like you're creating, you know, sort of like a different like your planet. And you choose how every little part of it is moving. Just like I feel like there's there's some sort of um, reference to to human life in some way. Do you think this is a little bit of um, um, an inspiration for you? So I, I like to apply my emotions to the particle. So <laughs> how I apply the emotions and how I feel about life to the particle is I make them like if the bad the. Yeah, if I am in a bad mood, I will I will let the particles just like move, like in a circle or move toward each each other to be a tangled shape or something. And if I'm in a good mood, I'm trying to make them chill with brighter color and make them like attract each other and <laughs> jump around. So I think that's pretty fun and related to my life experience and how I like to see like they behave in the system. And it's just like human, but to extract the the soul or some movement or motivation from for the particles. I love that you're you're referring to this as you know putting your emotions. So according to how you're feeling, you create a certain movement, a sort of interaction between between the particles. It's so it's such a it also almost makes me feel like it's a it's an intimate um connection for you. It's like a an intimate experience because it's almost like you representing your your soul and your um your mood at that moment and your true yeah. self there's some stuff about you know there's something about creating art and um and what it represents somehow sometimes it's very deep in our subconscious what we're trying to what we're trying to create and I love how you you're talking about you know how that's much about your emotions and and your your mood at that time um it's a very it's a very powerful process, I think. William, what do you think about this? Uh, I'm pretty much the same. Every day I wake up and every day it's a different emotion and I will share the great 
something different every day. Like my last picture was like blue and I was like, yeah, because it's just bright and in a good mood. So yeah, blue. So it's like an evidence. And sometimes mm -hmm. I'm like, oh, I'm not in the mood and I, well, let's make everything black, you know, and really uh, angry. And uh, I think, yeah, it's, and that's why I say like the machine is a tool at the end because it, it helps you to translate your emotion, your emotion, what, what you want to say. So, so yeah, definitely agree. Um, the machine can't have emotion, but have the, the computation power and it's the role of the human, the artist to inject, you know, the human part basically into the machine to have something new that is turned to art. So, mm -hmm. so yeah, mm -hmm. I think it, it even works, you know, even without the computer or like, yeah, have some uh, dice, you know, you have two dice and you're like, yeah, I'm gonna, if this is a one, I'm gonna make a straight line. And if this is a two, I'm gonna make a vertical one. And depending on your mood, you're gonna, push more or less on the paper. And I think if you apply the same algorithm every day with the same tools, you have some different results because mm -hmm. you're human. But mm -hmm. uh, so yeah, to translate that with code, I think it's important. I also feel that like writing codes is kind of writing poem to me right now, because um, once you're familiar with the tool, it becomes more intuitive. And then you start to feel that you are not even thinking about what you're maybe just you just enjoy that process of modifying something and see something more and it's very relaxing it touches you know our curiosity as a human and i think the art is really good at that like what's next you know yeah and and like even with, with your uh, short demo uh, minutes ago you're like yeah and this variable if i change this to this what does it make and numbers are almost infinite so there is infinite exploration to do so yeah, it's amazing to yeah this practice is amazing with it yeah <laughs> yeah and i and i like that you were talking about how that's almost like poetry right and that reminded me of um uh, kazi reese last week was saying how uh, coding is like a thought amplifier and you use it as a language to express yourself really right Mm, and and I think that's that's super powerful. And, and you know, talking about poetry, I would love to to go to William's work as well for the exhibition, if you can. Um, yeah, if you can show us a little bit about the creative process, because I know that you also very much inspired by by poetry. Uh, so yeah, the first thing when I was asked, you know, how can I bring my humanness into the machine? And I really like this poem by Paul Jalen. It's called. I guess through a whisper, je deviens à travers un murmure in French. I'm just gonna say it because it's just, it's just beautiful. Like, I guess through a whisper, the subtle outline of ancient voices and in the musical glimpse, tell love, a future down. Oh my God, it's powerful, you know, that's, that's deep, you know, that deep shit. <laughs> I was like, whoa, it's, and it's so human. And I was like, I'm gonna do, I'm gonna do something with this. And as I was saying before, like a lot of inspiration for me are painters. And, and I don't know why I made a connection because, well, I, I put an annotation uh, in how I interpret, you know, this poem, like to guess is to suggest uh, like whispers, like who, so who is the actor uh, in, my, in my piece, uh, the glimpse, does it need light or claws, like subtitles, so maybe it's, you know, it's really, like blurry, you don't know everything. So it's really about interpretation uh, and, and how you translate. So I would, I would say if any generative artist would have to do the same thing, everything, everyone will do something different. And I think it's, that is powerful. It is the humanness, you know, that we have. And yeah, then I went straight to, yeah, Sai uh, Twombly basically is a huge inspiration for me. Uh, like I can feel the emotion, you know, through the pain, through the brush strokes. And I was like, I wanna combine this kind of thing with my interpretation, interpretation and put it in some algorithm somehow. Uh, and I wasn't sure about what, but I was like, yeah, I really like this one. This is the main, I think the main uh, inspiration for my, for my piece. And I was like, yeah, okay, I'm gonna 
you know, I'm gonna do something not like copy it, but just being inspired by by it. And yeah, I started to iterate a bunch. Uh, so I like colors, as you know. So I made a bunch of colors stuff on at the beginning, and I was like, shit, it's beautiful, but it doesn't say anything that I want to say. So I was like, yes, yeah, next. And but I was okay. I'm. I want to make talk a square. So this is the whole idea of, of the piece, uh, and how a square can you know, talk to us through the screen. So this connection will exist, you know, between the physical and the digital. Uh, and then I started to explore more and explore more, and you no, know, changing numbers like you no, know, show you, and I was like, yeah, I, mean, I like this, I like this, but it's not what I want to convey. So I started to be more evocative, you know, to introduce some lines, uh, outlines, and then we're like, oh, that's that's really good. I like this one. Basically, it was exploring, exploring, like, yeah, I like black and white, but I still need colors. But uh, I couldn't really find uh, the process. So yeah, and then, yeah, I started to have some kind of stuff like that. And then we're like, yeah, okay, I have some structure. I have some square structure. I have some organic structure. This is the idea. And then I was like, okay, let's in inject more colors. And I was like, oh no, this is not anymore what I was, what I wanted. So I kept exploring in that path. This is basically the the process. Uh, so yeah, I think the square drawing, like morphing, basically dancing on the screen, and you're like. And I was, it was really a conversation in the way I was asking myself, what do you want to say to me? You know, like, is this, is there a message? Or can I inter interpret what I see on the screen? So it's very algorithmic, algorithmic and with numbers and very mathematical, but I think there's still some humanness in it and how you can interpret. This is, I think, the beauty of it, you know. So, and then, yeah, I ended up with, uh, the, the pieces that you that you know you know the, uh, those no those those ones the, there is four actually I uh, only sent three but there is four <laughs> uh, so yeah this one show us one. show us the one that we didn't see <laughs> <laughs> this one this one was the 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 four but it didn't it didn't make the cut because it didn't have any colors and I still wanted because you know of my interpretation here. Uh, the glimpse world with where was really important for me. Like I need some light. I need some. I need something. Maybe if it's a hint, a hint. I still need some. But and in there, I was like, yeah, it's really beautiful. But uh, no, no, it won't make the cut. But in the three pieces, there's a really tiny bit of colors, like really muted colors arranged. And I think, and I, I made it in three parts because I wanted to the square to to go from whispering to talking or singing and i wanted to translate that with colors basically so so yeah this is a, you have a bit of color and then you have yeah a bit more colors in the two and in the three you have proper colors like purple and uh, red and uh, yeah that's the whole idea behind, behind the piece I I I kind of had goosebumps before when you were showing us the video and you said, uh, "What are you trying to show me?" And it's almost like I had goosebumps because I really like the the way that you're portraying the relation with the machine as well, and kind of like, "What are you What are you trying to get out of this?" And you then kind of interpreting what is what is going to go out of it. It's almost like a conversation, right, with um, yeah. the machine. Um, I had goosebumps at the moment. I was like, oh, this is so powerful. It's like you in front of it, you're like, okay, this is what I'm asking you, but what are you giving me? What does it mean? Uh, what does it mean to me? What does it mean to you? Um, so super powerful. Thank you for, for yeah. sharing that with us. My pleasure. But, uh, yeah, that's the idea, yeah, how you, because like I'm not the best at, at writing, writing, algorithm. Like yeah, there's a bunch of people, you know, way smarter, smarter than me really good at, at that but I think my input is how do I see it as an artist how can I interpret it and how can I use those algorithm I also have a few of works that I haven't I didn't submit <laughs> the work <laughs> in progress <laughs> yeah I can share that a little bit 
Yeah. So this is the work, my work folder since two years ago. So it's, there's thousands of works here. And then the, uh, so this is the original one, the very village one. And then I try to play with the different color palettes and make a different ratio. So it grows into like a, a little, little bit like map thing. And in a, in a, I think it's, it looks also good in a, like a square ratio rather than a rectangle, rectangular ratio. And then after that, I start to think about how, how can I make it more like texture feeling? I want to make it like a painting or something. And then I start to apply a little bit like fail, <laughs> fail attempt to add textures. Mm -hmm. It becomes a little bit blurry. And then I try to modify with the like the different color modes. So I try to play with uh, overlapping and I try to make the color blend with each other. So it becomes more like um, sketches and watercolor painting. And I really like that feeling. So I dig into that for a while, like two weeks. And then I start to feel that I, I feel it's a little bit boring because um, I know that it's it looks good in the texture side. I know that it feels like watercolor, but it starts, I start to lose focus that what I want to express. <laughs> So I, I, yeah, though it looks good and it has a lot of details, just like watercolor and then you use pot color pencils to draw on it, but I still didn't get what I want to express to what's the theme and what did, what will it finally become and what will people see as an art, like what will they feel like? Yeah. So it's, it's, it's still the same work, but like iterating to the end, it feels fun and but I didn't submit because I don't think it's complete. It's never complete. <laughs> like never all complete. the works, yeah. it, it, it's hard. It's hard. It's hard to de define. Yeah. At which point do you decide to stop? Like, this is it. I, you know, I know every artist has that question and every artist is sort of like, you know, at, at which point do I stop trying to perfect it? But is there, is there, is there some, is there a process for you or is there a sign for you that you, that you know a feeling maybe or something? So that's, that's one question. And then I have uh, another one. Have you tried the opposite where you actually take away things from your, from your work? I, I think it's super hard for generative artists to call it a day uh, and to say, okay, this is finished. Generally it's because we have a deadline, but really I think it's infinite. And I, I'm not sure there is like a, you know, a point where we say it is finished because I, I like to think that my algorithm of today will be used like in 10 years from, from now, now on. So it's really, it, it's not an ongoing thing. It's never finished because there is an infinite possibilities of stuff. Um, so yeah, I don't, I don't like to think my something is finished. Uh, I had this um, really weird um, uh, feeling with anticyclone on my side because at some point I was like, is this finished now? I, like, am I allowed to continue? Uh, this is really weird. Like, I don't know. Yeah, it's, but it is like a dynamic, a dynamic with the market as well. So are you, are you allowed to, to do that? But I like to think, yeah, whatever. I'll, I'll do whatever I want, but still sometimes you feel weird because some someone said, oh, it's it's over. Uh, you know, you made uh, uh, some uh, bugs and you're like, yeah, now go on and move on. I'm like, no, I'm not finished. Uh, but yeah, it's really hard to call it a day. And I always use a method that to call it a day, really call it a day is I want to sleep. <laughs> and then I, <laughs> I know that uh, this is the progress I can make for today. And I make a, I write a short story or short porn for it. And, and then I just like send it out or post it on Facebook. But I know that each work can always evolve to a different form or evolve to a different, yeah. So that's why it's hard to push out the Artblox project or some projects like this, because it's hard to define what's the perfect or what's the best mm -hmm. where you can deliver. Yeah, definitely. Definitely. Uh, yeah, definitely for me, I think posting something on Twitter and I'm like, okay, this is a step in the journey and, and, I, and I can look back from this point, but, and I can move forward, but, and indeed, if I never post, I'm like, you know, circling, forever on my head and like 
is it good enough? Is it uh, so many questions? And but yeah, showing your work out there, I think is is a good step for you know, myself to to say, yeah. okay, this is my point today. <laughs> Basically, yeah. Yeah, but I, I think it's also good for artists to have deadlines because um, some artists really use like 10 years or 20 years mm. to make a work. It's good. It's, yeah. it's still a, a method of doing that, but it's hard to for people for just like making that kind of art and make maybe five works just in his life too. Yeah, it's a different route and it's a different decision of how artists think of their art. Yes, it's really hard. I, I mean... I think it, it depends on if you know where you're going, you know, yeah. a lot of time you don't know and you're like, and, and what's next? And, uh, and the idea, well, let, let me maybe show you my current um, project because I'm literally in that case right now. Uh, like, yeah, this project, this story started like, uh, like this basically like and it's and it's finishing like this and you're yes. like is, is this even the same project you know and yeah and i don't know what next but the progression shows me that i'm not done yet and i i mean i mean i i made a good progress and at that point at, at that time, I'm like, my message and my voice is that, but I don't know how it will evolve beyond. And I think it's really hard, really hard for, yeah, for me to, to be like, yeah, this is, this is the end, because I know there's so much to explore with yeah. the same algorithm. This is like infinite possibilities. This is crazy to me to think about it. But uh, yeah, I, I don't know. It's really hard for me to Call it today because I guess that also based on what you guys were saying before of like how much all of these artworks are based on your emotions. Uh, you know, every day we feel differently. So I guess it's easy to you know look at it the day after and think, like, yeah, it doesn't yeah. feel like what I'm feeling anymore. <laughs> so I have to change <laughs> yeah. it, right? That's yeah, good. The, uh, the the work also like my work also evolved to another series of work, and that even uh, that that didn't look the same as at all so i can show a little <laughs> bit so this is the the work that i finally begun like i, I try to add a little bit shadow to it and it feels like 3d world <laughs> so <laughs> you can you can never imagine they are the same one just like the with the <laughs> compared to the very very vintage one but so, so yeah. is this the same algorithm that you yes yes i, I give for the I give exhibition them yeah i give them different right. place to start growing and different a little bit mm. different direction but they're basically the same and just adding shadows and they will become like small mountains <laughs> yeah it's crazy like in yeah i mean with very little variation you have completely different results and i think it's really hard to to say okay i explored everything in this project yeah, yeah it's yeah. really hard yeah, but I'll, I'll give them a different name and just say this is a different work series. So I, I will never tell yeah. everyone that. Yeah, <laughs> yeah, same, same, same. same. Like this, yeah. everything is the same folder, you know. But yeah, it's different because because then your mind start to expand, but you're still in the same yeah. folder. But yeah, whatever. I just put everything in the same folder, but I know my train of thoughts, you know. So yeah, we know this is different, but yeah, it's still a yeah. mess in our folders. <laughs> Has it ever happened to you that someone? ask and like tells you their impression of your work and and you're like wow this is completely different than what i thought that the viewer was going to to think of on my side i think this is what i like about abstract art because it's all about interpretation and sometimes i want i want specifically to convey something but sometimes i'm really uh, evocative evocative and blurry on purpose and for me this is what it means, but for you maybe something else. But this, I find interesting how the same image can be interpreted differently. But yeah, that's basically abstract abstract art, and I like that the idea that everyone has its their own eyes, you know, and own thoughts. Uh, uh, when I'm um having my exhibition in Taiwan, then the physical one, 
like a lot of the, I, I found out it's funny that people love different works like some of the work I didn't like it a lot but some of the some yeah. of the people just they told me that oh I like it a lot I like the color I like the movement I think it's expressing something story or different from what I expected that's pretty fun yeah it happens to me a lot as well and I think that's also why I like to share on on socials like what do you think of this because I really hate it and sometimes like a lot of really likes Posts, posts are like, yeah, I don't like this, but I will still post it because I know that sometimes people will say it differently, and a lot of times people say it differently. So it's really interesting as an exper experiment to to share your work and show it to people uh, because usually they will have something different to say than you. And I guess, I guess probably the the critical um, part of yourself also comes out, right? So like you make a work. And at that time, it makes sense. It represents your feelings. Then when you go and post it, you're like, mm, this doesn't like feel right anymore, but I'm still going to post it. And probably it's the little, I don't know, the little part of yourself that it, tell, it tells you, like, this is right. Like, you meant to do this before and it will mean something to someone else, right? Do you think it's um, some like imposter syndrome uh, is part of the reason why maybe you feel um, a little reluctant to post some work rather than other? Uh, definitely imposter syndrome, syndrome is, a, is a real thing, I think, for a lot of us. I don't know why, but it is. Sometimes, you know, I could, like, share some new pictures every hour if if I wanted to, but I still need some some kind of secret garden where I don't share everything, and because all my emotions are not good to share, you know, basically. <laughs> so not all my images as well. So. Yeah, I like to keep some stuff private because I know they won't convey what I want perfectly. And sometimes, like I said, the, the goal is to wonder how people feel about it. But sometimes you really want to say something and people don't get it with your image. So you start to ask, did I paint well? The, what, what was wrong with my painting? Because people didn't get it. Uh, so yeah, it happens a lot, actually. But that's a weird feeling. When when I say something and and people are like completely different thing, um, and then you're like, oh yeah, I'm a very bad artist because I can't convey emotion, and you're like, oh my god, no. and then you're like, okay, go back to your uh, you know table, sit down, uh, breathe, and it will be fine. Yeah. That gets me to a question that um, if an artist take too much of the feedback or input from others, will it affect the artist like into it? like the feeling or what the origin yeah. of that feeling yeah so i really i, I start i still struggling to get that balance that if i need to add people more about if you like the color if you like the the feeling of the life of particles or if i just create my own and try to deliver try to convey and make people like it but i, I don't maybe i don't make like i need to make people like my work i just make keep creating the work i love and maybe someday they will just like feel that oh it's the good work I like and then collect it yeah yeah definitely definitely I think sharing too much is can be can be hard for your feelings if you have too many conflict conflicting feedbacks like you want to say red and everyone says blue and you're like yeah, yeah. but I wanted to say red so what the fuck <laughs> yeah. <laughs> yeah. yeah and yeah it's really hard when you yeah you have a lot of people commenting and and saying different stuff and you're like, what does it mean? So it, I think it's sharing, finding the good balance with sharing is, is essential, I think, because at the end it's our art and we have to own it and not letting others to interfere too much, you know. Everyone, everyone can have feedback, but if you have too many, it starts to, to become complicated, I think. Yeah, yeah. You last week we were talking to um Tyler, Emily, and Casey, and they were telling us that they have like sort of a sketchbook where they where they draw, they write their concepts, and that's a for them that's like their safe space. That's something they don't show yeah. to people. Do you guys have something similar as well that you really don't show, or is more like on your laptop? You have like a folder or something? Oh yeah, I have a sketchbook that I I won't show any like 
like never. <laughs> Maybe when I'll die, uh, you know, they'll show up. But yeah, this is a safe space. The, the sketchbook, like you can fail here. And I think it's important to have this space uh, to not be judged by, by other people. Yeah, even even if it's not on, on paper, even if it's on, on your laptop, on your in your folders, uh, because every artist, generative artist have thousands of outputs, but we don't show them all because there yeah, a lot of our sketches and you're like, yeah, it's good for me, but and nobody can understand it but me. So yeah, I'll keep it. Yeah. I also have a uh, sketchbook that I try just doodling. And sometimes when I'm happy, I just <laughs> show it to some, some of it to others, but um, most of it just doodling and keep some random thoughts and ideas in it. Yeah, random is a good word. Like mine is definitely not organized. Like it's really random. Like sometimes I, <laughs> like 10 ideas overlapping each other, but only me can understand it because, you know, I did it. So, I, I mean, if, if you look at my sketchbook, you will say like, what the fuck is this? Like, this is nonsense. But, uh, yeah, this is what Tyler and Emily and Casey were saying last week. They were all saying like, my sketchbook is a mess. I don't want to show it to anyone. <laughs> um, yeah, yeah. I, think I guess that this like- It's normal. You know, yeah, it's like, things that require different levels of feedback, like a sketchbook where you write down your draw things, concepts, write words, or anything that comes to your head, that really doesn't require any feedback. It doesn't have to be structured. It doesn't have to be, uh, nobody has to see it. So it really is about you and yourself. And then I guess there's another level, which is where you're working on something that maybe you want to have, you know, a couple of people that will give you feedback. And as you were saying, we have not too many, because at that point it will be just too chaotic. And, and then there's, I guess, the last stage when you release a piece of work, then you will have a lot of feedback. But oh, yeah, every that's a, yeah, that stage is the most stressful, I think, for mm -hmm. artists. Like when you work actually get out there and many people see it and you're like, oh my God, what people are going to think, going to say, is the message is the message still there? Like so many questions arise when the work is finished. Uh, yeah, it's terrible. It's every, every time it's it's hard. Like even for my pieces, uh, for the in the art code, I was like, oh my god, it's gonna be actual, actually physically displayed somewhere. People will come and see my work and judge the work. You know, I'm like, oh my god, this is freaking me out. It's like, it's pretty stressful experience. <laughs> <laughs> but hey, at, at the same time, it's really exciting. And because this is, we, we put our, like ourselves a lot in, into it. And it's very, it's, it's a very vulnerable thing, you know, to, to show your work. Uh, I, I think you used the right word. I was just about to say, like, it's a, it's a very vulnerable action to not just to create, but also to show it to other people. And and to you know experience all the feedback, comments, judgment, and and all that. It's a I think it's a very huge part of, uh, of of the life of an artist, right? To receive feedback, and sometimes you expect something, and sometimes you get something completely different. Um, and in both ways, it can be positive, and negative. But I guess that the stress about receiving feedback is higher than when you actually receive it. Because at that point, it's probably not going to be that bad ever, right? <laughs> mm. But the stress will be like, oh, someone is going to say something. Someone is going to see it. Because I think, I think that as we were saying before, there's like, it's a very intimate uh, work, right? Like creating art is very intimate. It's very about yourself, your vulnerable parts, your subconscious. And so when you're exposing it, it's like you're exposing yourself. And you never know how people are going to react to it. Some people, yeah. you know, some point will probably judge you for it, or or some. Most of the time, people don't really judge you. Most of the time, feedback is always good and constructive. I would say it's it's uh, it's more often that way. But I think that the idea that someone will think about yeah. it and will see it is is what really makes the stress, right? Yeah, definitely. It's it's more about the idea that someone could possibly hate it and. And yeah, it's more about that. Like, most of the time, people are, are kind uh, and supportive and, and con constructive. But yeah, still the idea that there's still a percentage of chance that it could go wrong. Yeah. 
Absolutely. My father is a, is a musician and he consistently asked me, I used to organize a lot of his concerts and there was like, I don't know, a hundred people in the room and um, most, most of them friends and family and, and friends of friends and so on. So people I actually knew and, you know, the, every, there was standing ovations, people were like, you know, loving it. And, and he managed to find the one person that didn't <laughs> clap. And he asked, you know, do you know that guy? And I was like, yeah, I do know that guy. And he's like, he didn't clap. I think he hated it. Was it bad? What did, what, what did I do wrong? Like, does it, was this a bad concert? I felt, I didn't feel right. What do you think? And he goes on and I said, you know, he's, he's Finnish. And, and, you know, I don't, I don't want to generalize, but um, the well, Finns, I don't know, Finnish, Finnish people are known to be relatively reserved, you know? And I said, it's probably more a cultural thing than anything to do with your... <laughs> With your work but he managed to find that one person right that didn't clap so <laughs> yeah I, I mean it's a human thing to retain the bad than the good so yeah perfect, perfectly human behavior i would say <laughs> yeah and it's also it's also perfectly human behavior to want to share something with others and have these human interactions with others right so like exchange experiences and information so on the one hand, it's like you're excited that you're sharing this work with people and get to know what they think. And the other is like, oh, they might judge it. So um, it's all human, but it's it's incredible. It's always important to talk about it as well, I think, because, you know, for upcoming artists, people that are starting, um, it's good for them to know that, you know, you get to a certain level where um, you're more well known than before. And even though, you are more well known and more successful than when you started you still can have these feelings and it's okay you know so i think it's very valuable that we talk about these things because uh, for for young artists you know it's a uh, it's something that they probably struggle the most and uh yeah so so thank you for you know for sharing this uh, these thoughts and experiences with us because i i think it's very very important and yeah, it is it is i wanted to kind of close the session uh with a question that's Kind of open um, for your interpretation in terms of, you know, the traditional art world or digital art world. What do you think is the future of generative art? What do you see that might happen in like five to ten years? Uh, that's that's always that's always our questions to see in the future. But I think we'll definitely see more uh, machine involved into art making uh, and i think i mean it's already already here with ai you know so i think it's something that we can't avoid today like digital art is here to stay and at some point that it, it will be more important than traditional because yeah we we'll, computers are part of our life now so we still we still we were still at the beginning of using them, but I'm definitely sure that machine will be more and more present in art. Uh, I also think that there will be more intuitive tools for people to just create something, just like um in the tr traditional way we use water painting, but nowadays we use digital computers. We can simulate all of all kinds of painting with iPad or computers. And maybe the next step is what we thought or what we behave can just intuitive, intuitively turn into an art or create something. That's I think that's the future, maybe the future of generative art. Is that it doesn't require to write code or to, to, to study something, to learn some tools, to create some art. And it just expands how you can behave and what you can create by yourself. Yeah, I definitely agree. Like to still today with like we have a lot of resources. I mean, yeah, to start coding basically, but still, still pretty much uh, hard, you know, door to open. Um, and when you open it, most of the time you're like so focused on coding that you forget uh, all about your know, your message and emotion and what you want to convey. So I definitely, I definitely agree. Uh, with you, like there will there will be tool in the future that allow us to get yeah, to to communicate better what we want to say, and not be so much focused on the tech. 
yeah just like a little bit like taking photos in the like in 200 years ago it's hard yeah. and it's just photographed you can take one but nowadays people can just express and just take out their phone to record what they want to mm. and also put some instagram filter and put some effects it's already in kind of an artwork and i think those kind of uh, quick ways to convert or express yourself is pretty fun yeah and and that i think that's why i love ai because it just it's just easier well i mean not ai like train your model and stuff like that yeah. but you know more like me Johnny and dali and stable diffusion like yeah now we can probably anyone can express themselves yeah. so it, i think it's really beautiful yeah and this just reminded me of um of the Tyler Sobs new project, Q, uh, Q, QL. Um, I think that's a really good example, right? Of how, you know, you get on a platform and if you don't know how to code, you can like choose your settings and give it a try. So um, I think that could be, you know, an example of, of something that will happen in the future. Yeah, definitely. I mean, Tyler is always ahead, right? So yeah, he's <laughs> leading the way, definitely. <laughs> Thank you for listening to the AOI streams. If you enjoyed this episode, please leave a like and subscribe to listen to more stories from the pioneers of the ecosystem.